Hey, welcome to Channel Surfing. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we just thought we'd take a minute to do a little bit kind of a different video than what we've done in the past and go over some of the system upgrades that we've done in the last several weeks and some additions to the boat. So we added a Rockna anchor to upgrade from the Bruce. The, bo the boats come with a Bruce anchor. Um, the Bruce was a 16 pound. This one's 22, a little bit extra weight. But more importantly, it's the shape of the Rockna and how the Rockna works. The, uh, the Rockna anchor is is good in virtually all types of bottoms. Um, the Bruce is going to struggle if it's like a hard clay. Um, it's going to struggle if there's kelp or grass on the on the bottom that prevents it from digging in. The rock now with this sharp point it has down here is going to do much better and dig in. When you set the rock to anchor, you drop the anchor, get it just on the ground, then you start moving the boat in reverse and lay out the rest of your chain in your road and it will set literally within a length of, of the anchor itself. You will feel the boat stop. Um, you know, the, the Bruce actually will drag a little bit and it may take you a couple chances to, uh, a couple tries to get it. That's one of the re main reasons why we upgraded to it was if you're spending the night on the hook like we like to do, um, <clears throat> we wanted something to make sure we were, we were secure uh, and so forth. Now with the Rockna upgrade, you don't have to change anything else on the bow roller and all that, it just fits in right. Um, the, the bail stops working, right? The bail is supposed to prevent the anchor from accidentally, like if you hit the windlass or it just started rolling off while the boat's driving, it's a safety mechanism to stop that from happening. Um, obviously with the rock net, it's not gonna do anything. So we just added a hook up here. <clears throat> Take a quick clip like right that to release it. And it's just tied to the cleat up top. That, that acts as a, as a, um, <clears throat> safety mechanism what the bail would normally do. In addition, we actually got called our first scratch, a little dimple right there, because it's it was really close depending on how it was how uh, tight I had the windlass on. So we just added this uh, mantis anchor guard um, <clears throat> to catch the blade and keep it from actually uh, touching there. <clears throat> right there. And we clip it in. And the anchor's done. So one of the other upgrades that we did was we added a, a Victron 712 battery monitor to the boat. Um, <clears throat> power management is really key. Um, the boat comes with four batteries, but it's really three banks. You got the engine battery, you have two house batteries, and you have a battery thruster, a bow thruster battery. And they're all separated. Now the house battery being two batteries, that's 220 amp hours. The engine battery is 110 and the thrust battery is 100. Basically all four batteries are 110 amp. So you get 220 amp hours for the house bank and 110 for the engine and another 110 amp hours for the bow thruster. There is a parallel switch that lets you join the house and the engine together. Um, that's really important to do that, to bypass the automatic charge relays when you're running like the inverter like you want to get hot water it's going to pull an awful lot of energy that will cause the acr to actually isolate the battery not join it because of the the, uh, the current draw so if you bypass if you parallel the batteries with the house and the engine you're bypassing the acr letting the output of the alternator of the engine right into all three batteries the engine and the two house batteries and the inverter runs off of that and you can get hot water as you're motoring um, you know, between stops and so forth. Um, so that way you have hot water and you get to your destination. Um, <clears throat> but once you're at your destination, say you drop anchor, you're on the hook, um, you turn the engine off, you've got your house batteries. There's two batteries that you're running everything off of, all your lights and, and everything else. Um, the <clears throat> anchor light, obviously you, you would end up running that all night for 10, 12 hours. Um, the the standard bulb in the anchor lights is an incandescent bulb that pulls 10 watts. That's a, almost an amp an hour. So you can figure there's 10 amps that you're gonna pull on an overnight with that um, out of 220 amp hours total on the batteries. And of the 220, you'd actually don't get all 220 amp hours of those house batteries. You're only gonna get 80% of that because they're AGM batteries. So you get 176 amp hours. And that's assuming the batteries are new and in good condition, right? Because batteries, as they age, they, they hold less. Um, so you're, this is the equation that you're fighting. In addition to the anchor light, you'd also have your refrigerators. The refrigerators are on all the time. Now, <clears throat> we have a cockpit refrigerator, right? We love our cockpit refrigerator. It's got a little freezer in it as well because it's our drink cooler. 
so I don't have to have an ice chest on the boat. That's a really nice to have. I'm not, you know, oh, to you know, go up and get more ice and, you know, dealing with, with all of that. <clears throat> However, the refrigerator takes more, more charge off the battery. So <clears throat> um, with both, both refrigerators going on the anchor light, that'll consume a third to half of my battery power while I'm sitting on the anchor, right? Um, it's an enormous drain. So how do, how do we combat that? Well, understanding what you turn on and what you turn off um, makes a big difference, right? Like, um, like I always shut off the chart plotter um, when I'm at anchor, don't need any of that. Um, you know, usually instead of listening to the stereo, we'll bring a portable boom, boom box that runs on battery power with Bluetooth stream from my phone to it. To charge all of our portable electronics, you know, iPhones, iPads and stuff, we bring, you know, lithium ion portable batteries um, to charge um, so I don't have to use the USB ports on the boat to save the batteries. But even as, as far as that goes, it's still a challenge to not wake up to a battery that's almost dead just because the refrigerators and that anchor light um, you know, take such a, a heavy toll. Now the anchor light you can upgrade to LED. That'll drop you from 10 watts to 2. So that's a, a pretty big savings overall um, in the big scheme of things for what the anchor light actually is. But you still got your two refrigerators. Now I could pull the fuse on the cockpit refrigerator and save myself some there. But I don't want to do any of that, right? So um, <clears throat> I'm looking at how do I use the Yamaha engine as a generator to charge the batteries just to sit it at idle or how many or how high rpm do i have to go to get that charge back in the batteries um, <clears throat> the victron battery monitor has a bluetooth app syncs to my phone and it shows me current wattage usage it shows me current draw it actually will estimate time to the batteries hitting that 80 percent charge so i can look and they'll say oh, you got 17 hours and 40 minutes before the batteries will be depleted and it'll tell me I'm pulling 135 watts and then I can go around and say, let me turn this off, let me turn that off. It also helps me make better decisions. Um, I came down here today to actually put a spreadsheet together, just turning on everything and seeing what the usage and, and stuff was. Like for example, when I come over here and I turn on the courtesy lights, the light up here and then the LEDs on the out, that's 20 watts, that's what it does. Right, um, you know, if I turn on the underwater lights for the back of the boat, probably can't see those because it's still somewhat daylight, but they're blue LEDs that go underwater. That's another 20 watts. Um, inside the cabin, we have um, yellow LEDs that illuminate the whole cabin. Um, those are 17 watts, or I can turn on the white overhead lights, and those are 7 watts. So I'm like, huh, if I need light in the cabin, I'd rather go with the white lights than the yellow lights um, if I'm conserving electrical, right? Um, so uh, the, the V-Birth was actually pretty interesting. The, the amber lights in the V-Birth um, pull 14 watts, if, but there's also four lamps, four white lamps that are individually turned on. If I turn all four of those on, I'm pulling, I think it was five or six watts. Um, so pretty big savings to run the white lights over the, uh, the yellow and amber lights. I'm not saying you can't run them, it's just understanding what your draw is and obviously how long you keep something on matters a lot too. Right, um, so I'll show you what the Victron monitor looks like. <clears throat> so come over here, and that's a, a battery shunt. Basically all the negative has to get, for the house battery has to get routed through that device. That then talks to a gauge that we had mounted in the um, in the galley. Got a gauge right over here just for a, a quick reading. You know, I can cycle through the numbers and it'll say, oh, we're currently at 12.8 volts. <clears throat> you may or not may not be able to see that with the illumination of the LED, but it says 12.8 volts. Um, it's a negative 8.96 amps right now. That's 100, negative 115 watts, which means I'm consuming 115 watts currently. Um, <clears throat> and you can say that this is just a, a quick quick way to always read it. Gives you a percent charge of the batteries. Um, but I'll show you this on my phone. This is actually what the, the app will actually show you. And it's all real time. I can turn lights on, I can turn lights off. <clears throat> you know, and you can watch the the, the readouts change. So that was really helpful. And then in addition, one other thing we did. So now I, now I can see my actual usage of the batteries. When I turn things on or off, now I know what, they, what they're gonna cost me from an electrical perspective. So when I rig for electrical, for reduced electrical, 
you know, I have a better sense of what I can use and what I can't and what it's going to cost me if I turn something on. Um, but how do I get more juice? Because right? it's still only the two batteries. So I have them here by the batteries. So what you see right here, there's, there's two batteries, one here, one right behind it. And then all the way in the back, there's a third battery that's the bow thruster battery. And right here is the on off switch for the thruster battery. So we swap that out and we put in an on off combine switch. So right now it's in the on position. If I rotate it to the combine, it actually joins the bow thruster battery with the house bank. So now instead of 220 amp hours, I've got 330 amp hours. And I get 80% of that number that just added another one third capacity to my overnight um, usage on the battery. <clears throat> Pretty easy upgrade to do that. <clears throat> and what we figure out is with the engine running at idle at 600 RPMs, the manufacturer spec sheet says it actually puts out about 25 amps at 600 RPM. They say it does 50 amps at 1,000, which isn't much above idle. Um, actually measuring it with the Victron, what I'm seeing is I'm getting, um, I think it's 10 to 15 amps at idle and about 20 amps, um, a little bit more when it's at 1,000 RPM. So effectively idling it at about 1,000 RPM is pretty equivalent to what shore power um, is going to give me on a charge to the batteries. So you can sit there, you know, while you're on anchor, you're not going to take the, use the engine to get your batteries from, from dead to full, right, necessarily, but I could certainly could run the engine for an hour, hour and a half, two hours at idle to put some charge back in and prolong my fun at anchor um, without having to actually pull the anchor up and go drive around to recharge the batteries or go and hit shore power somewhere. So one of the other things that we added was a Garmin GXM54 antenna um, up on the top. You can see it right up there um, on the mast and it does two things it gives me XM radio um, through the stereo um, which is nice to have we have it in our cars and uh, uh, listen to that quite a bit so now I can have it on the boat it also gives me XM weather on the chart plotter which is really what I was after um, I'm going to talk first about the radio um, quickly when you integrate the um, GXM 54 um, with the boat it connects to the chart plotter the chart plotter, there's a little box it has, takes power to the box, and the antenna goes up to the X, the GNSX, GXM54, and then a cable from that box goes to the chart plotter, and then there's a pair of auxiliary cables that come out. The auxiliary cables connect to the fusion. So when the radio's on, it's connected to auxiliary. The radio says it supports Sirius XM, which it does, but it's connected to auxiliary off the chart plotter, so it's not using the XM functionality of the radio. So all you'll see on the radio is it'll say auxiliary, and to change channels and so forth, you have to do you know, change your state radio station all through the uh, chart plotter. You can put the chart plotter to sleep, and the radio will still continue to play XM. If you turn the chart plotter off, the XM will stop playing. That's a disadvantage of doing it that way. It costs more electrically for that because the chart plotter is going to have its uh, its load, and I think if I remember, it's about 27 watts. It's going to pull, which is kind of steep. If you want to use the XM feature of the radio, you got to buy an XM antenna for it. That's all it's missing, and the antenna should be able to just get mounted up underneath and um, and give you sufficient signal. I will probably end up doing that in the long term, but in the short term, weather was what I was after up here. We spend a fair amount of time this summer up in the San Juans, and I know very well, very well where I get good cell coverage and where I don't. Um, you know, we went into Reed Harbor and I could make cell phone calls, but I had no data at all. Uh, if I went out of Reed Harbor, which is up by Stewart Island, um, they, once I was hitting the once I was in the middle of the channel, motoring away, I had great uh, great data. And most of my weather apps and I'll all come in on my phone, which requires data um, to do that. So what happens when I go into a harbor, a cove? Um, you know, there's uh, Jones Island, I remember, um, in the North Cove, there was no data. Deer Harbor has very limited data once you're in the harbor and so forth. So that was the main interest with getting weather added to the chart plotter. So now I can come up and I can look at real time and say, what's the weather station? So Friday Harbor right now, you know, the wind speed's three knots, temperature's 70 degrees. Um, you know, and it's, it'll do forecasting as well. You can go out 12 hours, 24 hours with what uh, the forecast is supposed to do. <clears throat> um, so that's kind of nice. Um, it's also, it'll do, you know, precipitation and, 
you know, it's not going to do wave height and so forth. The, the XM weather supports all of that. Inside Puget Sound, they actually don't have the sensors to tell you what your wave height and period stuff is. They do if you were to go out uh, west of Nia Bay out into the open ocean. Um, <clears throat> uh, they have those types of sensors and, and you'll get those reports. But up here around the San Juans and Puget Sound, that data is not here to, to grab. But you will get surface temperature of the, of the water as well as local weather around and you'll get wind. It tells you, you know, what direction the wind's going through. That's these dashes you see all over is which way the wind's going and it'll tell you what the intensity is of the wind. And at sea, that's really what I mainly care about is wind. Wind brings waves. It's that simple. If the wind is going one way and the tide is running the opposite way, so they're going opposites, that gives you the worst sea state. If the tide's going one way and the wind's following it, that gives you usually the best sea states. Hi there. So if any of you have questions about this power management stuff and it maybe went over your head like it does mine, like, <laughs> uh, go ahead and put some comments below and he will answer you because it won't be me. Some other things that we get asked about also. So we have a Facebook page uh, we run. It's called Channel Surfing. I. I am predominantly the one posting to the Facebook page, so it's usually a visual story of some sort as I try and do, so it's usually pictures. Sometimes I do a, a couple short videos here there, and mostly it's pictures with a little write-up. The YouTube is all done by Lazina, my co-captain, um, so I provide a lot of content uh, and stuff for it, photographs and videos I take around and about in the boat, but she does the YouTube videos. I, I see the YouTube videos the same time you guys see the YouTube videos, so we're all equally surprised together. And probably the last thing to talk about is, is uh, oftentimes people ask us uh, if we had any previous boating experience before buying the Ranger Tug. Um, talk about that briefly. Uh, I was in the Navy for eight years on uh, submarines. It's actually what brought me out here to Washington. I was stationed on the USS Tenosa. Uh, I was part of their decommissioning crew. Uh, we went from New London, Connecticut out here to Bremerton to be decommissioned. And then from there I got stationed on the USS Georgia and I spent six years on it going to sea out of Bangor, Washington. Um, aside from that, for small recreational boats, uh, Lizzie and I bought our first boat in 2006. It was a 22-foot Maxim bow rider, 24-foot overall, wakeboard boat, trailerable boat. Uh, we've had that boat all over the place, you know, Moses Lake, uh, Puget Sound, a lot. Uh, we actually took our honeymoon in that boat from Everett all the way to Bedwell Harbor, Poets Cove in Canada. Um, pretty pretty fun trip. Um, being a wakeboard boat on Puget Sound was very different. Um, obviously, you got to pay a lot more attention to the to the waves because the, with a bow rider, you, you don't want to take a wave over the bow. You can sink the boat. It's just a big hood scoop. But we hit a lot of boat ramps. Um, had a lot of fun with it. Um, did a lot of wakeboarding, a lot of fishing. Kind of figured out what we liked, didn't like with um, for boating, and that's how we landed with Ranger Tug. Is we decided the kids are grown and it's time to move on to something uh, more for. Uh, mom and dad to go have some fun in the water and we wanted to be able to have a good fishing platform and we were looking for something with a heater <laughs> heater would be good lengthens the season for boating and we wanted a bathroom on the boat and really a place to be able to cook and an overnight would be great um, uh, ironically enough what we found was we thought um, <clears throat> that we would use the boat primarily for daytime trips with the occasional overnighter and the first summer we've had the boat, we actually spent more, more overnighters on it than we did daytime trips because the boat's just that comfortable. And it's, you know, you can go further places and then have a lot more fun there um, instead of racing back to the dock at the end of the day. <clears throat> and then uh, some other little upgrades that we did. Obviously, we mounted the fire extinguishers. Um, so we put, we put one fire extinguisher right back here, screwed that in. Um, pretty convenient place for it, uh, where it's available to the cockpit and so forth. We'll put the uh, other fire extinguisher, probably where most folks do, uh, right here. Um, then uh, with all the screens, all the windows um, have screens in them, and we're taking the screens in and out constantly because when we're at sea, we take the screens out because you're moving the windows, you're opening and closing them a lot to let air in and let air out. And um, the bugs don't really come in when you're moving. Right, and there's no <laughs> bugs while you're moving. When you're at shore, you got the bugs and you want the screens in. So we're constantly moving the screens all over. So we put in, basically it's just a magazine rack that screws into the bulkhead, primarily to put the screens in. But also, we also keep some uh, some maps and stuff in there too, some charts, paper charts. 
and it fits really good with the uh, life jackets you know the four that we're supposed to have on board as well and then we had the helm box at the top which placed me to throw my junk my binoculars my log book uh, the covers for the uh, electronics in the front so this was uh, Lizina, this was Lazina's idea so these are the screens that go on the side windows they already have velcro on there so she just stuck velcro on that we we're looking for a place that they could hang they would be flat they keep bending we because keep them. <laughs> they keep bending and getting folded and those are the screens that cover this window right here the screen that covers this window right here just the screens keep bugs out All right so another upgrade is the mattress from the yacht bedding mm -hmm. show the topper comes with sheets and bedding it is awesome it's the bamboo you can undo it if you want. So that's the mattress topper. Uh, we did sleep a couple of nights on the boat with the cushions that the boat came with. Um, huge difference between that and the topper. I would definitely recommend the topper. The other thing we've been asked about too is there's actually a, a dining room table that sits right here in the middle um, for the V-berth. We've actually never used the dining room in the V-berth. From day one, we lowered it, made a bed, and it's been a bed ever since. Um, we have the dining room table right here, right, which is obviously, um, you know, seats four people. And then there's also a table that actually sits out in the uh, cockpit area. Hooks into that hole right there, and it's a table just as big as a dining room table. And then you've got your chairs so that come out. This one comes so out. having two places, an inside and outside dining room, we just didn't see any. We didn't see any. We didn't see any <laughs> need to uh, to have a third dining area in the V berth. So we just made made that basically a stateroom, effectively. <clears throat> That's another cool little tip to, to do is uh, when you have your own slip, right? Um, get your own dedicated set of lines and tie your lines to your slip. No. These, these set of lines don't ever leave. They, so when we decide to to go to sea <laughs> it's tight up right now. we pull it in and we leave this on the dock yep. and that way um, when we come back these lines know exactly where the boat needs to be um, so yep. we just I just step off the boat and attach them and then and there's the other one yep. and then we have two bow lines that, that, that Tip alone makes it real easy to grab the keys, come down, take the boat out, bring the boat back, retie it back up, walk away. And instead of always trying to finagle the jet and adjust the lines and so forth, at least for your home port when you know exactly where the boat's supposed to be, uh, to be tied secure. Okay. And one other addition we, we added to the boat was a suicide knob. A lot of people say, why do you need a suicide knob? What is a suicide knob? It's this thing right here that just spins with the wheel to make it quick to go stop to stop. It's five and a half turns to spin the wheel from all the way port all the way to starboard. We have an outboard, which is cool because we have direction um, for where we, where we turn the motor. And we also have a bow thruster up here as well. And the two kind of work well together. I've actually found myself using the bow thruster a whole lot less with the suicide knob because I can get all the way from the port hard stop to the starboard hard stop um, quickly when I'm maneuvering. We always jokingly say docking is a controlled collision. <clears throat> uh, so when we come into come back to port every time at Port of Everett, we actually have to go all the way down into our slip. We have to come down into the docks and I have to make a U-turn and then come back up because the wind almost always um, is coming against me and I've got to turn the bow into the wind to get into the slip, otherwise it blows me into a And I'll cell. show you. We're on the very end here. So he goes down probably about there and spins around. As I get, I get halfway down um, in the dock between the slips and I'll sit there and I'll take it all the way hard to port, put it into reverse, tap the bow thruster to starboard and the boat will just start to spin right about its center uh, center point. Then I turn it the other way, right? And then I tap it into forward and let the boat continue to, to spin the other direction and keep tapping the bow thruster to starboard. I just keep working it back and forth that way. It usually takes me four or five tries of, 
of port to starboard, um, forward to reverse to get the boat to do a 180 degree turnaround. And then it brings me coming back up the, the, the channel between the docks. Now it puts my nose into the wind and then I just make a left turn into the slip. <clears throat> so, um, and also even for just regular driving, sometimes it's more convenient to use the, uh, the suicide mount. I use it all the time. <laughs> I want to thank you guys for watching and stay tuned for more adventures from Channel Surfing. And subscribe so you get notifications and you can see our videos right away. Like <laughs> and subscribe. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. And go check out on Facebook. Channel Surfing, right? Channel Surfing on Facebook. Mm -hmm. See you next time.